All right, everyone, we're going to get started now. Uh, welcome to the final session, I know, sad, uh, of the Field Hockey Canada Conference. Um, we'd like to thank everyone for tuning in all week long. If this is your first session, that's great. We're so excited to have you as well. Uh, today, we have Sarah Rastani on the line, and she's going to be leading a session about growing the game at the grassroots level. Um, also, we have other Field Hockey Canada Conference staff, Haley Yap and Grace Lee on the line as well. They're monitoring the back end. You'll see them pop up in the chat, helping with the participant list. Um, so thanks to them for also all the help they've had or all the help they've given all week long. Um, it's been a blast being able to put this on. Sarah is our uh, guest presenter today, and she's the president of the Field Hockey, uh, the Halton Field Hockey Club, where she's a coach, a parent, and a player. Um, wears many hats. She's the uh, Kid Sport Ontario Program Manager, and she's also the 2020 Field Hockey Canada Grassroots Coach of the Year. So we're so excited to have Sarah on. Uh, I'd uh, just like to make a land acknowledgement. I'm coming to you from Vancouver, which is the traditional lands of the Musqueam, Squamish, and Tsleil-Waututh Nations. I encourage all of you to do a land acknowledgement wherever you are tuning in from today. Uh, just a few housekeeping notes before I turn it over to Sarah. Uh, the session today will take about an hour, and if you have been to these sessions before this week, you're probably sick of hearing all of this, but just listen up for 30 seconds before I turn it over. Um, please keep your mics muted and your cameras off, unless otherwise specified by the hosts. Um, we recommend you view it in presenter or preview mode. I, I suppose as soon as Sarah takes over, she'll share her, sque her screen and then uh, set it up however you see fit. Um, if you have a question, please, please, please feel free to write it in the chat box and Sarah will get to them when she's able to throughout the presentation and if some slip to the end, we'll also have a Q&A period at the end. But I know that Sarah wants some engagement during the session, so definitely write them in. We'll be sending out an exit survey at the end of the session. Um, so please take a chance to fill that out. I know a few people have missed the exit surveys throughout the time because we sort of send them out and then close off the session. So we appreciate that it's not, you haven't always been able to click on it right away. We'll be sending out all the exit surveys again in follow-up emails. So um, if, you, if, you have a, if, you, if you miss it today, you can still do it tomorrow. If you're counting this session towards your NCCP professional development credits, uh, indicate that in the survey and we'll make sure you get your points. Um, Send your conference bingo card to Haley at the end of the session and uh, be, have a chance to win uh, one of three Field Hockey Canada mystery prizes. And a final thank you to our sponsors, Griffin Hockey, Osaka Hockey, and Frontline Medical Supply for all the support they've given us throughout the week and throughout the year. So um, without further ado, I'll turn it over to Sarah. Let's grow the game at the grassroots level. Sarah, fire away. Thanks so much, Kevin. Hello, everybody. Uh, thanks for spending some time with us on this Friday afternoon. Um, I'm going to share my presentation. If there are any issues seeing the presentation, please um, throw a note up in the chat box and um, we'll fix that. Now, I would like to uh, do a land acknowledgement uh, here. I'm in Halton Region, which is just west of Toronto, for those of you that, that don't know. Um, Halton Region is um, uh, traditional territory land of the Mississaugas of the Credit First Nation. So I would like to um, acknowledge and thank them for sharing this traditional territory with us. Um, so as Kevin mentioned, uh, I'm going to um, be reviewing some of the lessons that uh, we have learned as a club, so Halton Field Hockey Club, and um, what it's meant for us to uh, grow our sport at the grassroots level. So going to hit on a couple of things. I'm going to uh, do a quick intro about the club. Um, so where we're coming from, review the what and the why of grassroots programming, talk about how we can establish some roots for our sport and where do we go from here? Um, my intention here is to reinforce uh, the value of grassroots programming. <clears throat> so we can understand um, why we shouldn't be ignoring it, why we should be giving it as much support and promotion as we can. Uh, I'm not going to pretend to be an expert in any of this. There's definitely smarter people out there who have spent careers and lifetimes um, working on this. So I will, um, I'll defer to them for some of those expertise, but otherwise, um, you know, I'm going to speak about our experiences as a club and uh, it, within this sport of ours. Um, I could also spend an 
awful lot more time than just an hour <laughs> because there's a lot of lessons we've learned over the years. Um, so please, uh, as Kevin mentioned, I'd like to encourage some some discussion, uh, share any uh, experiences you might have had that maybe parallel what we've done, um, things maybe you've tried, uh, and lessons you've learned um, that we can add to this. Uh, also throughout the presentation, I will have, I have uh, three poll questions in here. Uh, you'll be asked to open up a website called slido.com or if you have your phone handy and can scan a QR code, uh, that will be another option for you as well. Okay, so a bit about us. So Holland Field Hockey Club, um, we've been around since the early 1970s. We started as Oakville Women's Field Hockey, a um, group of women who uh, just wanted to get together and play some hockey. So from there, uh, they became a member of the Springfield Women's League that operates here in Ontario. Uh, in the 80s, we were renamed to Halton Field Hockey Club, um, having structured house leagues for women and high school girls in the 1990s. Uh, from there, the program started expanding to include youth programs, junior programs, women, competitive teams into the early 2000s. And right now, as a club, um, we operate as a, non -for a registered non-for-profit. We are a club of over 200, or sorry, 525 members, and we range in age from six years old to 60 plus, um, playing at all levels of programming. The big thing about this is that we've been a consistent presence in the landscape of field hockey in Ontario. Um, and this comes from both an athlete level to coaches, to officials, uh, Field Hockey Ontario board members. It's been really important for us to be part of that landscape. Our biggest successes have come from listening to our members and understanding what they need. And I'll get into more of that a little bit later. Um, and we've also had some really key members who have been bedrocks of this club um, from the early days and still uh, in, some, uh, in some capacity. So some names that might ring a bell, uh, Diane Huneau, uh, Nicola Davies, Vanessa Williamson. So these, these ladies were really integral in um, the development and refinement of what our club currently is. There's a lot of uh, misconceptions, I think, surrounding what grassroots programming is. Um, you hear grassroots, you have a, an immediate thought about it. And I think, um, you know, we need to really understand what it is and what the place of grassroots programming is in the landscape of sport. Not just our sport, but sport in general. So we're gonna talk about um, a couple of things here, but I'd first like to understand the types of clubs you're involved in, the programs uh, that your club mainly focuses on. So we're gonna go to our first poll. Think about the primary focus of your club. What's the primary offering? So you may have multiple versions of these programs in your club, but what is the top program, the one you have the most participants in. Okay, so high performance. Now this was something for us with our club. Um, up until recently, it was pretty even between all of our programs. So we had you know, almost um, 120 in sort of each of the youth, the junior, the women's and our competitive programs. Um, it started to shift uh, probably about 10 years ago, uh, our junior program, which is what we call our high school program. Uh, it runs um, a house league within our club. Uh, that's sitting at 160 members now. So, okay, so we've got youth development, so intra club just you know for wondering the difference between intra so that's within your own club you don't play against anyone outside of your club inter club is you only play against other clubs all right so youth development program is a big one um and i'm glad to see that that's topping some of these lists that's great um 
inter-club youth competitive, awesome, adults competitive, great. All right, that youth development program is taking the lead. This is cool. All right, so yeah, I think this is, um, this is definitely something that uh, grassroots programming uh, really does focus on is that youth development program, but it's not the only thing. And we'll talk about that a little bit more. So um, thanks everybody for answering the poll. Um, when it came to us as a club and our place um, at the grassroots level, we really wanted to understand where we fit in terms of the different types of um, offering within our sport. Uh, this was a um, sort of a pillar diagram. There are so many of these, but we really like this one because it was very clear for us. Um, we fit into pillar three, and it was about the foundation of the sport and increasing participation. Um, pillar four, talent identification and development system, that's sort of the next step from there. But for us, that pillar of number three was very, very key for us. But if you have a look at that pillar, it's not um, a tall pillar, it's a wide pillar. So this is something we, we had to look at. It's a wide offering. It's not a narrow focus. Um, I think for us, um, it was knowing that, you know, field hockey is, especially here in Ontario, it's not one of the biggest sports, right? So what is our, what's our place? What's our place in Ontario as a sport? And then as a club, how do we fit within that, um, that framework? So knowing that field hockey is still a growth sport, um, establishing a solid foundation was very key for us. And we knew based on uh, the types of programming we had, the participants we had, the kinds of successes we had, we knew we could be a very important part of that and um, work in a meaningful way within the sport. So we're gonna talk a little bit about the what and the why of grassroots programming. Um, Jen Began uh, on day two of the conference, she was talking about um, Simon Sinek and his um, understanding your why, knowing your why. And this was really important for us is knowing um, why we were doing the things we were doing. And we've spent a lot of time over the years really making conscious efforts to, um, to define that clearly. So the first thing we had to understand was what a grassroots program is and what it isn't. So ultimately, grassroots is accessible to all, meaning regardless of um, socioeconomic, regardless of um, uh, gender, race, religion, it's accessible to all. It's inclusive to everyone. So once you're within the program, it's inclusive, right? It's, the, it's a team sport. So, uh, you know, on its face, it should be inclusive. Um, it's fundamental in the offering, right? It's, um, uh, it's not specific, it's very broad. And then it's fun, right? So fundamentally, it's about putting people on a field and letting them play. So that's what grassroots programming is in our mind. What it isn't, is it isn't just for kids. So if you saw in the poll earlier, a lot of the programming was around youth development which absolutely makes sense. However, it shouldn't just be about the kids. There should be more to a grassroots offering, and I'll get to that in a little bit. Also, it's not just an introduction to program. It's not just learn to play. Grassroots, like I said, it's about just getting people on the field and letting them play, regardless of their skill. So that's, that was also important for us to understand. So why is that important? Um, the grassroots programming, is meant to establish a foundational love of sport, right? So you're getting that, uh, that first look of a sport or you're getting um, a further look at the sport, right? And it's going to help you fall in love with a sport and fall in love with being active. It helps build different communities. So communities of athletes, we saw that during uh, the presentation with our um, 
national team athletes uh, yesterday when they talked about, you know, their group of um, cohorts, their friends, the, they, be, they were from their team. And so that's part of what we're building. We're building communities of coaches, people that have the same excuse me, the same goals, the same aspirations for the sport in creating well-rounded athletes. It's also communities of involved citizens. So we're talking volunteers, we're talking parents who are um, helping with fundraisers, they're handing out uniforms, um, they are, <clears throat> excuse me, um, they're volunteering uh, as a club member within their community. And I think that that's, um, that's a very big part of grassroots programming. But also, why is it important? Because our elite athletes, they have to start somewhere, right? Um, so this is, this is how we viewed our programming and why we felt it was important. Something else that we should consider though is who? So who makes up grassroots programs? <clears throat> They're just people who love playing the sport, right? I think fundamentally, as I said, it's just about putting them on the field and letting them play. So we're talking high school players who, you know, they, they were introduced to it, they loved it, they wanna play outside of school. Um, we're talking adults who played when they were younger, but, you know, they, they wanna keep going. There's an outlet for them, they wanna still stay active or they're trying it for the first time. Maybe their kid picked it up and they thought, yeah, that looks kind of fun. I want to, I want to give it a try. And then it's the young kids who are trying something new. They have a parent who played, uh, they have a friend maybe who saw it. I think this is, this is key for us to understand that grassroots programming makes up all of these people. It's not just the young kids. They appreciate a structure, right? So there, there's games, there's practices. Um, they want to be part of a team. They want to be sports social. So, you know, a big part of being part of a team is, um, I can speak from an adult perspective, it's uh, you play the game, you sit around with your teammates afterwards, um, you, you know, you go for dinner, or you go for a drink, or you, you know, you're chatting. I can tell you that some of the women I've been playing with for 20 years are still some of my closest friends, and I think that that's really key, and that's just grassroots right? I'm not an elite athlete, um, but these are grassroots um, players. These are women in my community, and um, I'm honored to have them as part of it. Another key thing is that their levels of skill and competition are going to be varied across the board, but within a grassroots program, you can accommodate it, right? You're not relying on outside competition. You're not relying on um, somebody else to make that happen. You can do that within a grassroots program. Once we've figured out our what, our why, the who um, is involved in our grassroots program, it's now about embedding yourself in the community you're operating in. So this was and still is a very big part of who we are as a club. It takes a village to operate a grassroots program. Um, all the best intentions of a single person um, are amazing and definitely needed, but they need help. And there are all sorts of places to get that help. And I think some we do better than others. Um, make friends around you. Now those friends, um, the, the municipal sports department. So here in Halton region, um, city of Burlington, town of Oakville, um, city of Milton, <clears throat> they're our friends, they know us. They are willing to work with us on our program. They are happy to have our sport as part of their community makeup. Community sport councils, um, they're, they're all over. They're not as widely known as a lot of people, um, as a lot of people hope that they would be, but they're out there, so leverage them. They can definitely help you create and uh, embed your program within the landscape of your community. Talk to your local school boards, right? So reach out to the um, administrators of the physical education within your school boards. Um, talk to the coaches from the high school teams. I think um, I saw a name pop up and I, I believe it's one of our high school coaches from out here. Um, he's been now coaching in our, um, 
our junior house league for more years than I can remember now. He's part of our community, he's part of our village. Um, your PSO is really important and I think um, there's a lot of things we can do as a sport better to leverage our PSO to support grassroots programming. Um, I could talk about that a lot more, but we'll leave that to the side for now. Um, and then other established sport groups. Now that's within our own sport, but it's also outside of our sport. So within your sport, there are other um, clubs that are doing the same thing as you are, maybe in a different way. So for us here, we've developed, um, you know, sort of club relationships with um, Nepean Nighthawks um, out in Eastern Ontario. We have, um, you know, our friends in Udaway, we have our friends in Kitchener, um, uh, Godrich uh, out in Peterborough. We're, we're reaching out to other clubs who are operating similar programs and saying, what can we do to support you? And you know what, we could use your support in this. And that's really important. I think we need to talk to each other a little bit more. Um, but also it's other sports. So we've been able to work with um, other sports in our community to run um, things like learn to play days. So this was something that happened, um, I believe it was back in 2014. Um, there was a rugby, uh, there's a rugby club out here that wanted to do a learn to play. They couldn't afford the field on their own. They asked us to participate. We shared the cost and we did uh, learn to play rugby and field hockey. And it was really great for us to be able to, um, to share that with them. We're not competing sports necessarily, but you know, we're, we're operating in the same community. It gave our community members a chance to come and try both sports at once. Um, it's a great question about measuring, um, having specific metrics throughout the, the season. We do, we talk to our members an awful lot. They're part of our village. Right. So for us, um, <clears throat> reaching out to them at the end of every season, what did you like? Uh, what worked? What can we do better? Do you have suggestions and ideas? And we incorporate those going forward. And I think that that's, um, that's something that we um, definitely strive towards. There's always something we can learn every season. There's always a new way of doing something, and that's that's really important. Um, it's it's more than just registration numbers. You're absolutely right, um, Kara. Um, insurance with Learn to Play. So, our Learn to Play program um, is covered um, through the city. We have insurance through the PSOs um, for facilities. In terms of players, we have waivers for our Learn to Play programs. So participants that aren't currently members of our club and don't have insurance that way, um, work with a waiver system to, to handle the insurance side of it. I'm happy to share some of that information for anyone who's looking for those kinds of pieces. Um, but something when you talk about the village is don't forget that you have advocates in your, in your corner. So people who maybe were your coaches, or are currently coaches within the program who can help, you know, speak your praises to whoever will listen. Um, talk to your teammates. So people that you played with, um, people who, uh, especially in different sports, what do they like about their programs? What, um, what lessons did they learn? What kinds of things helped them um, proceed through their sporting career? So that's definitely something to, to lean on as well as your family and the families of your members. If things go well, they will tell everybody. <laughs> they will bring a friend, they'll tell their neighbors, um, they'll talk about it at the grocery store. Um, I have to say that being able to, um, you know, have one of my family members who doesn't even live in my region, talk to someone say, oh great, you're moving to Burlington. My sister is, you know, involved in a club out there if you're looking for a new sport they will do it for you. So, you know, lean on them. They're definitely, um, they're definitely there for you. Um, part of the village is community coaches. So community coaches, I think, um, 
the, the importance of them in our club um, is the fact that we have over 30 of them. We cannot run any of our programs without our community coaches. They are, um, they're from all different places. They're high school seniors uh, from our junior programs or our rep programs that, you know, they said, I really wish I had learned to play this when I was younger. And I want to, I want to come back and they work with, with our littles, as we call them. So, um, you know, the, the youngest um, are under 10s or under 12s, or they will partner with a senior coach and learn the game that way. Um, they're high school coaches as, and Steve, if you're there, hi, Steve. Um, they're, you know, they're learning uh, different coaching techniques. They're expanding their skills. They, they love the sport. They love coaching. It's some of their athletes. They want to come back and do a little bit more. So that's great. We have player parents who, you know, they're on the sidelines and they say, well, I'm here anyway, might as well give it a shot. But they're also non-player parents. Um, my husband is one of those. He's not a player. Um, you know, he never picked up a stick before he met me. He got involved. Our kids are playing. And he said, oh, I'm here. This would be really great. Teach me how to do this. So those are the kinds of um, people who become community coaches. But ultimately, they all came to this place because they have a love of sport. Now, not just our sport, but sport in general, and seeing kids out on the field, right? They have a desire to get more kids involved, to see our sport grow. So we, um, we're so fortunate that we have the community coaches that we do. Um, and uh, I'm grateful that more and more of them can, you know, continue to come back and uh, put their hands up and, and do even more. So they're, they really are amazing. Um, speaking of that, our next poll. Can you remember a community coach who sparked a love of sport for you? Doesn't matter what sport, just a community coach, somebody who was there early for you. Because I think those of us involved in sport, in whatever capacity we're in, we likely had a coach that sparked a love of sport for us. So for me, um, when I was about nine, I had a swim coach. Um, this guy was a fish. He just loved being in the water. Um, he spent whatever time he could uh, teaching or training. He was, he was a competitive swimmer and he, this was his, this was his place. Never complained about the time, never complained about um, going in, uh, going in the water multiple times a day. So I just thought it was amazing that somebody could love doing something so much. I mean, I was a kid, right? Um, I didn't stick with swimming, but when I first started playing field hockey in an organized setting, I remembered him and I remembered how much he loved being part of sport. Um, and that, that has always kind of stuck with me. So um, great question, Kevin. Um, tips on community coach recruitment and retainment. I'm going to get into that. Um, there's definitely, when people see coaches having fun and doing something, um, that always uh, is a first step, right? So if our community coaches are um, uh, enjoying themselves and talking about how much they love it, that's always a good step to get coaches involved. So great. So 73%. Yeah, I think that that's, um, that's definitely reflective of, um, you know, sort of what we see, right, is that a community coach, they kind of stick with you. Um, they, you know, they made it fun. They made you want to come back. So when we talk about um, engaging community coaches, um, there's, there's a couple of um, really obvious things we can do, but then there's some other uh, additional things that maybe we don't do enough of. So unlike competitive or high performance coaches, community coaches, they're not just focused on the X's and O's. It's not just stick and ball drills for them. Um, their job is to make sure everyone has um, <clears throat> fundamental skills, solid understanding of how to play the game in a safe and fun manner. Um, in our youth and junior programs, they're hands-on, they're in the mix, 
um, with our adult programs, we don't necessarily have coaches per se, but you know, we have some leaders within the teams who, uh, you know, sort of player coaches. And I think out of everybody, 99% of the time, they are unpaid volunteers. We'll occasionally have the one who's involved in a, in multiple capacities, but you know, that's sort of what we're, what we're looking at. They are unpaid volunteers. They are just giving their time. They're a key building block for the sustainability of our sport. If it wasn't for them developing that love within the players, then the players will drop off. And then without having the players, we don't develop up that, um, up that funnel. <clears throat> so give them a plan, right? You want to, um, so we're talking about, you know, not just stick and ball drills, so give them a plan. Uh, I don't know for those of you that remember the fun sticks program that was in place for many years. It was the first plan I used as a coach uh, to work with the, the younger kids. Great resource. It's something that we should keep having for our community coaches, something because we know that they are not just, um, uh, you know, somebody who has already played, they may not have a, a full understanding. So let's, you know, let's provide them with that. Make sure they're equipped, prepare them for the season, right? So simple things, give them a binder with all the important information. So their emergency action plans, player information, key contacts, dates, locations, um, give them enough balls and cones. <laughs> balls and cones are something that you know, community coaches can never get enough of. Um, give them a whistle, something as simple as a whistle. It's huge, right? Um, we talk about acknowledging their contribution to the growth of the sport. Um, uh, the small picture that you can see there, Sport Oakville here does an award ceremony every year and the clubs get to submit um, members of their community. And one of those is a coach of the year within your community. So it's a chance for us to put them on stage in front of the other sports and, and let them know that, um, you know, they are, they're valuable to us. Um, ask them to be part of the talent ID process. So this is when you're operating in a competitive, um, a competitive program, if you have um, something that uh, you're trying to develop that way. Your community coaches have a very unique understanding of the athletes, um, the, the ones who want to become more competitive. They, you know, they got to know the families a little bit closer. They got to see them in a different environment and a low stress environment. <clears throat> so they can help you provide, uh, help by providing some insight into who those kids are, into who those athletes can become. Um, so talk to them about it. You know, it's not just standing on the sidelines and pointing them out and saying, I'll take that kid and that kid. Talk to the coach, involve them, make them feel part of that process so that we know that their involvement in as a community coach is valued. Um, we also want to talk, and, and this is something that um, I'll get into a little bit more here, but you know, Kevin, when you mentioned recruiting, um, part of the recruitment process is not just saying, hey, would you like to coach? Great, come on this day. It's about showing them that, you know what, we're going to help prepare you. We're going to provide you with um, training materials. We are going to provide you with um, uh, resources to reach out to. Um, we're going to provide you with everything you need to have a successful season. Um, recruiting the coaches, it's finding that finding someone who has shown interest, right? So um, for us, we've recruited a lot of coaches from our junior and our um, rep programs who they have said those things like, I really wish I learned to play when I was younger. Awesome. Um, you know what? Why don't you come and work with me and work with these younger kids so you can do that. You can help. You can give back. That's a big part that that always tends to resonate with folks when you say give back to the sport you love. So that's definitely part of the recruitment process. Um, recruiting through our high schools is also a big part of what we do. We have, um, I think at last count, seven high school coaches coaching with us right now. And, um, you know, it always sort of changes every season, but we have a few of them that, that come back every year. 
and um, it, it's a big part of our recruiting process there as well as talking to the high schools and you know if somebody who just started coaching at their high school you know they got sort of voluntold um, you can reach out to them and say we have an opportunity for you to learn a little bit more what do you think about coming to coach with us this spring um okay so the next thing i want to talk about a little bit there's, there's a couple more things on the community coaches but i'll come back to that sport for life um so we talked about how important it was for the kids we know the value of community coaches in grassroots programs but the other part of grassroots programming for us is sport for life um we understood that our junior players they become adult players we understood that those adult players they become parents right we know that those parents they'll become involved so it, it's a way for us with once we understood that process we knew where we could come into um, you know, whether it was the recruitment, Kevin, like you asked, um, of coaches, whether it was keeping people involved after high school and after university, keep coming to play. This picture I'm showing you on the screen here, um, this is, so let's see, there are board members, house league and competitive coaches, umpires, high school coaches, former high performance athletes, and a few parents, and they all play together. So it doesn't matter in a grassroots program in this environment how they got here. All that matters is that they're here and they're playing the game. So keeping those junior players engaged to become adult players, keeping those adult players, keeping the game top of mind for them. So when they become parents, they can then become involved parents who want to take up coaching, who want to become umpires team managers who will talk about your club and your program to their neighbors and to their friends and bring more people in all right so last poll and this one is more of a word cloud so think about if you're still playing or playing anything really why what are the words that come to mind as to why you still play? Um, are you playing for your health? Are you playing for fun? Are you playing because somebody dragged you out <laughs> every, every weekend and they said, you know, come on, we need a, you know, we need an 11th on the field. Grab your stick, let's go. So why is it that you're playing? when it came to sport for life and our adult programming you know we really really focused on why so because it's it's still a part of that funnel um it's it became really driving reasons why we were offering our programs right we had to provide them programs that reflected why they wanted to be there so you know uh, the question earlier about talking to the members at the end of the season and getting some of that um, that feedback our adult programs was key to that right so really talking to them why are they playing why do they keep coming back and then we built around that so these are some really great answers i love it uh the post beer drinks yes definitely uh adrenaline identity meeting people friends yes absolutely the camaraderie is huge fun i love that that's a big one same with exercise these are all um you know key to why um grassroots programs for adults is important because you know we we think about all these things um if it wasn't for the fact that um adult programming existed right it, you know we wouldn't have a lot of these things so it was really important for us we talked to them and we said yeah yeah the you know the exercise is great and i love being able to get out on the field and run around and feel like i'm you know getting my heart rate up or everything but i really love hanging out with my friends afterwards going for that post-game beer right the lifestyle um yeah these are all really really great thank you everybody so don't discount 
adult programming when it comes to your grassroots club, okay? Really, really um, consider offering that because um, it then provides you with a very well-rounded program. So where do we go from here? So, you know, we've understood why um, grassroots programs are important, why we're doing it, um, you know, establishing ourselves within the community around us and engaging our coaches and our players. What do we do now? So we, we've acknowledged the importance of the sport. As, um, as a community, as a sport community, we need to promote grassroots programs. I don't think we do this enough. We're, um, we do a really great job of promoting our, uh, our high performance teams, our national teams, uh, the people out there who will bring in the dollars for a sport program, right? Um, but the club system, especially the last grassroots programs, um, they are, they're generally self-funded, self-run, right? They do it because they have a love of the sport. But some other things that we can do to help them, so promote them, share their stories, share their successes, their struggles, right? Sharing a struggle is a huge thing because someone might have an answer for them. Um, fund them. So, you know, in talking about them being self-funded, we're looking, if we look at what's happened in this past year, clubs um, have not been able to run, especially, you know, modified programming, but not really to the capacity that they're used to. Their coffers are really dry at this point. Um, relief funding from the governments, it's not flowing down to grassroots levels. Um, so how can we help fund them through grants, through um, access to some of that funding that you know, has maybe trickled its way down into the sport landscape. So help those grassroots programs who are struggling. Support them. This is a big part of it. Help train their coaches. Um, suggest volunteering among high performance athletes down at the club level. Uh, help them find facilities. We know facilities in our sport is, is a big, big struggle. Um, having a having an advocate to help promote for access to facilities will go a long way to grassroots programs. And then value them. Value them as a collective, right? We have to stop referring to these programs and the clubs as just a grassroots program. They're valuable to the continuation and the success of sport across our country. Um, without them, we wouldn't have high performance athletes, right? Um, because those athletes, they had to start somewhere. We wouldn't have high performance coaches. Again, they had to start somewhere. They had to be exposed to coaching in some capacity. Um, success at the international level will then flow from having a nice solid base to that pillar. Um, otherwise, we're leaving talent on the field. Um, they won't go anywhere. They will uh, diminish because they're not enjoying themselves. There's not a robust system to help them through. As a sport community, we have a role in helping grassroots programs come back from the virus. I'm tired of the name, <laughs> so it's just the virus now for me. Um, clubs helping clubs, this is a big thing. Um, you know, I had an email the other day from um, one of our uh, friendly clubs who said, hey, looking into registration platform, what are you guys looking at? Um, can we chat? Can you offer suggestions? Um, so I think talking to the clubs about what they're doing, what you can do to help, um, how can we get back to playing in the new year? Are you going to run your tournament? Those are, those are all really big things that we can do to support each other. PSOs and NSOs helping their clubs as well. Um, asking them what their immediate needs are. So right now, um, you know, working with our PSO to identify, you know, how can they help us recover from all of this? This is a, you know, it's just a simple call, it's a simple email. How can you help us recover? Um, clubs helping communities. So staying visible as a club is really important to us. 
So keeping visible among city councils, sport councils, other charitable groups in, in our community so that people know that we're still active. Um, the last thing people want to um, have happen is they don't hear from the club, they assume it's shut down and they don't come back. So being active, helping out in your community, staying visible um, is really going to help clubs stay the course and come back from this next year, right? Um, there's a really great uh, report that I came across. Um, it's, it's focused on um, physical activity and COVID-19 and the relationship between the two. Um, I'll put that into the chat afterwards for anyone who, um, who wants to have a, a read. There's a lot of findings in there that show um, how important it's going to be for community programs, uh, grassroots programs to be viable to help communities come out of this whole thing we've been living in. Um, and how we can support each other. So there's a lot of really great lessons in that. And I, like I said, I'll share that with you. Okay. So we're getting into our summary. Can't believe it's already happened. Understanding grassroots programs, it'll grow your participation at all your levels. It will allow for a diverse sport landscape and it will keep the sport relevant and successful. This is really just fundamental for what grassroots programming is going to do for the sport landscape overall. Us as um, field hockey, we really, um, you know, we're trying to build participation across the country. It's fundamental to what we're trying to do for um, the resiliency and the longevity of our sport. So, um, you know, let's really support our grassroots programs. Let's talk about them. Let's encourage more people to um, develop new grassroots programs, to grow the existing ones, and to participate in them. Um, for a community with no existing field hockey, what are the three key pillars you recommend? That is a really great question. Um, the first thing I would suggest is talking about your, um, is looking at your coaches. Um, who is going to help run a program for you? You need to definitely have those folks in place. It's reaching out to uh, schools that currently have a, uh, you know, a field hockey team and, you know, talking to them, do you want to play? So it's really um, understanding if, if there is a need for it in the community uh, and then building upon that. And then I think the, the last thing is, um, is then getting yourself embedded within that community. So talk to your, um, you know, your regional council, sport council, and say, you know what, we don't have field hockey here. I think we need it. So what can we do to get started? So I think that that's definitely um, a key piece. Um, so for me, that's it. Uh, I'm going to say thank you. I'm going to stop my share, and then I'm going to get into some of these questions because I think there's some really great ones here. So thank you everybody for, um, you know taking some of your time today to listen to this. Uh, as I said earlier, I could talk about this for hours. I have so many things I could share. Um, I love this picture. This speaks to why we do what we do. This is our rainbow. This is our, these are our kids. Um, they, they come out every year. They come out on a Saturday morning at 8 a.m and they hit that ball around and they come back every year and we love we love doing what we do for them so um so thank you for that um okay so questions um can we in field hockey canada start a grassroots committee working uh, a forum working group to share resources information best practices i think we should um i definitely think we can do uh a whole lot more sharing of information. I know, um, you know, um, out in Nepean, you guys have done some incredible things that, you know, in uh, that we've taken and said, you know, how can we adapt it for what we're doing? We've shared a lot of information. So I, we need to talk to each other more. It is definitely a key piece that we don't do enough of as our sport. Um, there's too many silos, in my opinion. They're, they're coming down. They're definitely getting better. However, I think 
um, encouraging more communication among co among clubs, among um, uh, you know folks with with uh, resources and ideas and backgrounds that can help. Um, we should absolutely share that, Holly. I, I agree with you. Um, how do we keep community members playing and engaged with the grassroots program? There's often a drop in participation once people don't make it to the national level. Yeah, and I think that that's, um, that's something for us that was really, really um, challenging at first, I think, when it came to our adult programming. We had to bring it down to a level that made it still fun to play their game because ultimately, you know, a high performance athlete gets into the sport because they love it. And then all the other pieces fall into place, right? Their competitiveness, their willingness to, um, uh, to win, to push themselves, to see how far they can go, all of those things. But fundamentally, they got into the sport because it was fun. And that was something we really tapped into um, when it came to our adult programming is that it became about the fun again. So, you know, we, we're not having them come out three, four days a week. For the most part, they're coming out once a week. It's once a week. It's an hour.